thank you for your patience. Um, my name is Louise Pine Jones. I'm the head of research of IOHR. I'm going to keep it very brief and just allow our speakers to actually detail the pressures that human rights defenders are facing. Um, so we're actually going to uh, start with Nurjan Baisal, who is an award-winning Kurdish human rights defender and journalist. Um, she will tell us some stories about the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin with some of the sentences of some mothers from Cizre, a Kurdish town. He had no head, only a part of his jaw, and a few hairs from his beard were left. I recognized him from those hairs. I looked for his teeth. I knew it was him from the molars. He had no scar. They gouge out Yasemin's eyes. That's what I think of the most. Did they gouge out my daughter's eyes while she was still alive? Three years have passed, and there still isn't even a hair from my daughter's head. She was a high school student, and they burned her. In all likelihood, they threw her remains into the river. I wish had just a strand of her hair. Mehmet was 10 years old. He was killed on his birthday, asleep in his bed. I want the world to know that my little son was murdered in his bed. Can a 10-year-old child be a terrorist? Seyda's corpse stayed on the kitchen floor, where he was killed. We couldn't go into the kitchen to take his corpse for a fortnight. Imagine your loved one's dead body is in the kitchen, and you can't go in there to take it from the floor. Are not these scenarios unimaginable? These are just some of the stories that I, that I wrote in the last few years. I am repeating them now because I want you to understand the level of human rights violations and war crimes in my region of Kurdistan. In the 21st century, human rights have been explained at great lengths in books, laws, constitutions, and international agreements. However, none of these laws or agreements was able to protect the right of Said, Yasemin, Hajar, Mehmet, or Seda. None of these laws prevented 15-year-old Yasemin Zayt from being gouged out, or 19-year-old Hajar from being burned alive, or 71-year-old Seyda's body from lying a fortnight on the floor, or little Mehmet from being shot dead in his bed. Between 2015 and 2016, the Turkish military operations in cities across Kurdistan violated human rights, beliefs, religions, and laws and they were justified with a single word, terror. Let me tell you what happened five years ago in my region. The peace process between the Turkish state and the Kurdistan Workers' Party closed in July 2015. And in August of that year, the clashes began in Kurdish cities. This time, the clashes were in the city centers, which, is, uh, which was different from what typically happened in the last 30 years. The state declared military curfews across in Kurdish cities. At the beginning, these were curfews for a few, for a few days. After a while, the curfews became regular and month long. And sometimes when we talk about the curfews, people don't understand how kind of curfews they are. So I, need to, I want to tell you a little. When the governor's office will declare the curfew, bombardment will begin. And days went on under bombs and gunfire. No one could enter the curfew area. People in the curfew areas were trapped in their houses as they continued their lives with limited food and water that they had stockpiled before the curfew. Although people didn't go outside, they died inside their homes as Sharapnel hit their houses. The state would not even allow families to bury their dead. In some cities like Jizre, mothers put the dead bodies of their children in refrigerators to prevent their decomposition. In some curfew areas, people carrying white flags in order to leave the area or to, be, to bury their dead were also shot. In my hometown, Diyarbakir, bodies remained in the streets for months. We witnessed terrible human rights violations and war crimes. And mainstream Turkish media, they closed their eyes to what's happening in my region. And at that time, I have taken an active role in informing the public about what's really happening in our region. And in 2016, I began to receive threats, especially from Turkish nationalists and security forces in relation to my work. 
I have been threatened and harassed systematically, intimidated on social media, and security forces have unlawfully banned some of my articles. And investigations opened against me due to my articles and social media posts. Last uh, two years ago, January 2018, days after Turkish offensive to Afrin was launched, I was detained because of my social media post against the war. The police entered my home by breaking down my door, a home where they knew that there, are, there were two small kids inside. Because of five tweets where I criticized the Turkish government's war policies and demanded peace, I was accused of terrorist propaganda and calling for provocative action. In February 2018, I received a 10-month prison sentence because of my article, because of one of my articles that covered the war crimes in Kurdish town of Cizre. Recently, only three months ago, during the Turkish military operation in Syria, in the early hours of the morning, my house was raided again by 30, 14 masked, heavily armed special forces. Without any legal basis, they ransacked my house with the clear intention of scaring my children. My two sons were held by their hair and dragged out of bed by masked special operation team members and forced to the ground. Their father was also forced to the ground with a gun to his death. Again, all this was all due to my anti-war social media posts demanded peace. And three months passed, and I still haven't been given legal justification for the raid. No one really knows, even the prosecutor who gave the decision to raid my home. And I am really lucky because I'm here. Many people are not lucky like me in Turkey. Many of them people, many of my friends are in prison now. And uh, I want to tell a little about the, how it is to be a Kurdish human rights defender in Turkey. It is hard to be a human rights defender in Turkey, but it is worse to be a Kurdish human rights defender. It is really so hard to deal this kind of human rights violations. After the end of the peace process, the state security forces and paramilitary forces have openly targeted human rights defenders living in Kurdish cities. Some of them were put in prison. Some of them were forced to leave the country. And some of them, like Tahir Erci, were killed. Many human rights defenders who work in state institutions as teachers, doctors, nurses, religious people, or lawyers have lost their jobs under the emergency decrees. As a result, today we have just a few human rights defenders in Kurdish cities of Turkey. And all these defenders were under great risk of imprisonment. And to be honest, I really don't know what tomorrow will bring. I admire the people who can do summer holiday plans, plans as we can't. Every morning, we check to see who has been detained that day. And as human rights defenders living in Kurdistan, we have limited connections with international organizations, international human rights organizations. Because international human rights organizations, they're afraid to visit the region, or the state doesn't give permission to them to visit the region. And being a Kurdish in a colonized society, it is difficult for Kurds to be heard inside the hierarchy of Turkish society. And there is so much violence, but there is also so much indifference when it is about the Kurdish people. We need more solidarity. It is crucial. If today international institutions had not raised their voice for me, I would be in jail today. And I want to give some last statistics about the human rights defenders. According to the report of Frontline Defenders just published two weeks ago, more than 300 human rights defenders in 31 countries were killed in the last year. These numbers clearly show us that we need to do more to protect human rights defenders. We need bold leadership to take concrete actions, and we need to demand more from the UN mechanisms to protect human rights defenders. If not, I'm not sure we will be able to find anyone standing for human rights in my region in a few years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nurjan. <clears throat> and, and we'll move straight on to Dr. Shebnam Koror um, Finjanji, who's president of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey. Thank you. Thank you very much, particularly the International Observatory of Human Rights, for inviting us. It's a good opportunity for all of us, although I will try and be very quick and brief about what I talk about. Uh, dear Nurjan told that it is difficult to be a human rights defender and more difficult as a Kurdish human rights defender. 
so then we can describe the situation, a very difficult situation, more difficult than taking a truck over the tree. Uh, but we struggle a lot, and since 1980s, we have been struggling for human rights being realized in our country, but there is a different time period now for Turkey after the coup attempt. So we have to take into consideration how did the president describe the coup attempt afterwards? We have to consider it because it was a blessing of God. So if it is the worst part of the situation, how can you call this a blessing of God? Yes, it's a blessing of God because they try to change the situation and the policy in the country. What happened? 32 decrees after the coup attempt and state of emergency. And all the public services have been, in a way, demolished, we can call it uh, like that, because more than 130,000 people were dismissed immediately, academics, legal professionals, uh, you have talked about the rule of law. Uh, it is abolished because there are no lawyers, no prosecutors anymore in the country. Once we always had uh, some lawsuits against human rights defenders, but then we knew that we would acquit. Now there is an arbitrariness. You know nothing about the result of a court case in Turkey. So it is important. Of course, then uh, all the procedural safeguards have been just neglected. They are there, written in the law, but not practiced at all. So we have long detention periods, long police custody, which means that there is severe torture in the country. Yes, we are used to it because state of emergency had been half of the period of Turkish Republic in our country, unfortunately. But what did we see? Uh, the national uh, official broadcasting agency in Turkey just broadcasted these photographs of torture, which means that they are not afraid of any kind of uh, human rights uh, violations, criticism from the international organizations. But international organizations, the bodies are very important to monitor Turkey and human rights violations. Uh, in order to protect the human rights defenders, uh, we have to protect all these procedural safeguards. Uh, elongated police custody system uh, just leads to torture, of course. Uh, and we can see how during the AKP government, the prison population has changed. It is more than five times now for today. Uh, it started with 59,000. Now it is 286,500. So we human rights defenders have the threat to go to the prison, but Already the prisons are full and over the capacity in Turkey. Human Rights Association is the most prominent human rights organization of Turkey, uh, founded in 1986. Now there are uh, 221 lawsuits against Human Rights Association's executive members. And uh, co-chair Eren Keskin has 143 alone. Uh, while she already had been convicted to prison sentence for more than 17 years, and uh, particularly uh, she had also fines together. Uh, also, as a chair of Human Rights Foundation in Turkey, I have been convicted to two and a half years as a peace academic, and also uh, just have several court cases. Uh, yet the appeal court. So many of us has these kind of legal proceedings in the country. Uh, also, the organizations have administrative and judicial procedures against the legal personalities. Uh, so there is a suppression throughout use of 
uh, abolishment of rule of law in the country. Uh, and they criminalized all the human rights organizations, human rights defenders, opponents, and professionals in the country. For example, these are some examples of uh, newspapers just calling uh, professionals, for example, physicians as terrorists in the country. Uh, Turkish Medical Association executive board members have been convicted uh, to prison, uh, and it is in the appeal court. We don't know what will happen. Throughout the three years, I had three separate cases being a terrorist or propagating for a terrorist organization because I'm a human rights activist. Of course, we were against the suppressions. So uh, while we try to have demonstrations, uh, we are under attack again. Of course, there is nothing new under the sky. For example, one of the uh, former presidents of Human Rights Association had been shot just in the middle of a day. Uh, Ranting was killed in the middle of a street. Tahir Alci was killed in the middle of a street. Uh, and when we discuss about the situation, uh, Turkish government had responses for criticism, for example, they have no interference with the demonstrations. They uh, just uh, discuss and answer the concerns. You can see a March 8th women's demonstration where the police had stopped. And also some allies of the government just criminalize the human rights organizations and women's rights organizations. Saturday mothers are banned from the streets. Uh, and when we consider the numbers, now we can see that every one person out of five prisoners are terrorists in the prison. So the, these numbers are very important. Who are the terrorists? For example, the lawyers are the terrorists. Who are the terrorists? Human Rights Association's president is the terrorist. Uh, who are the terrorists? Uh, you know the uh, Prince Island's case, for example, Amnesty International and just major human rights organizations members are terrorists. Osman Kavala is a terrorist and criminalization of the organizations are very clear. Academics for peace are terrorists because why? They demand peace and the curfews and the killings killings of the civilians, when you criticize, then you're a terrorist in the country. If you say that more than 500,000 people are just displaced in the Kurdish region, you are a terrorist. If you ask for health care, you are a terrorist. If you just show a bombshell just on the windowsill of a house, a civilian house, you are a terrorist. If you find a children burnt bones in the house and say that civilians were burnt and killed in that house, you're a terrorist. So they burnt our rehabilitation center in Jizre during the curfew, killed our volunteer nurse while he was providing health care on the street, but, but we never just regret for our choices. We are human rights defenders, and we have to keep in mind that this is a climate very similar to the period in between the First and Second World War. And this is a post-truth area. So keep in mind that what you hear from the states might not be the truth itself, and the banality of evil is just in front of us for all. But human rights struggle is the hope of the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Uh, finally, we have Annie Van Riesel, who is the former co-chair of the EESCEU Turkey Joint Consultative Committee. Thank you, Annie. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me speak here. I will not speak so much as a former co-chair of the EESC. I was, I was the rapporteur for Turkey, so, but I will basically speak as a trade unionist 
I've been uh, international advisor to the largest trade union in the Netherlands, FNV, and in that position, I got to know um, Turkish trade unionists um, uh, in a way that now here I can testify that they are human rights defenders in Turkey. Um, the right to establish or join a trade union is actually protected by the International Covenant on um, Civil and Political uh, uh, Rights. It is in Article 22 as part of the right uh, to assembly. So it's, it's, it's only logic to include in our, uh, in our discussions on human rights also the right to establish a trade union or become a member of a trade union. So that's one. But it's not international law only that makes um, independent trade unionist human rights defenders. Um, the core business of trade unions is to pre improve the lives of uh, their members and the workers in general. This easily brings them in uh, conflict with established powers, be it the state power or be it economic powers. The whole purpose of trade union rights is to empower and enable workers who are in a disadvantaged position to stand up and, uh, and protect their rights, their right to health, their right to life um, uh, and well-being. So it is, it is predictable that in a situation of oppression like we've heard in Turkey, that also um, uh, trade unionists and workers who stand up, if only for their livelihood, are not welcomed. Um, it's, it's predictable that the leaders of these trade unions will openly defend the freedom of press and the freedom uh, of assembly because it's actually the air and the blood they live on, they function on. So uh, I would like to mention um, one uh, respected trade union leader, actually the first female uh, trade union uh, president, the president of a trade union confederation, Arzu uh, Cerke Zoglu. Um, she was in court in December recently. Um, initially she was indicted for uh, spreading hatred and conflict or a similar phrase, which could be anything, of course. Um, in December, there, it was added that she insulted the president. Many of my trade union friends have insulted uh, the president, and I must say they're very cool about it. They are not, they don't, it doesn't make them too nervous that they have this indictment uh, pending on them. But um, uh, Arzu is also a very cool and quiet person, but she has seven years pending over her head. And uh, I must say that I am uh, concerned. She's a high profile case, but what I would like to say is that also the ordinary workers, the metal workers who have been out on the streets with 100,000 uh, 19th of January, just to uh, demand a living wage, uh, announcing that they will go on strike next month are facing great risks. They risk to be dismissed. Um, they risk to have a social stigma attached to them. So um, they are among our friends, human and trade union rights defenders. I want to end with the last, uh, maybe a little bit uh, uh, hopeful uh, statement. That is that we're here at the Human Rights Council process. Strangely enough, just around the corner, there is the ILO, the International Labour Organization, also monitoring these rights, the freedom of expression uh, as, you know, as a core right, the freedom of assembly as a core right. Um, last June, Turkey was discussed at the conference, ILO conference, uh, for violating all these basic rights. The ILO decided to put pressure on the government to live up uh, to, uh, to respect civil rights, to create an atmosphere free of violence for trade unionists, to um, 
uh, so, and other very specific laws that has to be changed for Turkey to comply with basic ILO standards. There has to be more coherence. That's one of the things we can do maybe to increase the pressure on the Turkish government, who I do think are not totally insensitive to international pressure. Of course, they will um, try to channel it in a way that the fundamental power relations in society are not changed. But still, I think there are still um, possibilities to be better defenders of the brave human rights defenders in Turkey. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you.